I mentioned Barbarian Vince in a video I did on lighter games that I enjoy, and that is a print-and-play game, although the version I'm showing you here, which was sent to me by the designer, is available for purchase as um, actual cards that I'll show it to you. And here are the design credits, and this is the website. I'll put that up as well. I got a lot of comments on it because there wasn't uh, a video in English that exists showing the game, and the rules are a teeny bit confusing, and people were expressing some interest in my doing a little video on it, so I'm going to do that. This is a solitaire card adventure. It's a deck of 54 cards, and through the course of the game, you are traveling through this world. All of these maps come as map cards, and I'll show them to you, and they can be played simply with the cards in the deck. I'm not going to be playing it exactly that way, and there is available online on the file section of BGG and possibly on the website too, a version of the map to print out all put together so you can move your little token around the map and I prefer to do that and I'll, I'll explain why. You're moving around this world, you are using the cards to have encounters and to become items in your hand that will help you with encounters and to try to solve any one of three bigger quests that you can come across during the course of drawing through the cards. It is a uh, game that, as mentioned, is completely free. You can download all the files or you can purchase the actual cards. It's a game that does not have unlimited replayability because it's a deck of 54 cards and you will see the encounters eventually again if you play it repeatedly, but there are three different quests. There is a mechanism in the game to have you uh, modifying the encounters that you come upon in terms of difficulty, and there is enough randomization that it has quite a few gameplays in it, and it is if you allow yourself to become involved in the journey of Barbarian Vince, you can, and here's the little story I'll just show you on the back. I'm having a little throat issue, so I'm going to try to conserve what I actually say, but you can read this for yourself. If you allow yourself to become involved in the story, you can indeed um, feel like you are doing um, a little card adventure. What you get inside the game box is a deck of 54 cards, as well as the rules which are contained in this pamphlet here. As mentioned, there are some rules ambiguities and I've just modified these to be my best understanding of what they are. The game is set up so that you can play it while holding all of the cards, the cards that are in your hand and quote ready, as well as the cards that are exhausted sort of in your hand and you don't need to do any discard or play to a table. I feel that's a little bit source of the confusion, so I'm not going to be playing that way. The other modification I am making is that each of the cards, or most of the cards, have on them a random number. So you're meant to be able to play this game and draw random numbers without using any die. I am not doing that. The reason that I'm not, so I'm going to be using a D12. Now, the uh, there's a couple of different versions of the rule set. This version of the rule set that came with the box that I have does not mention the possibility of using a D12. The original rules that I had when I did my print and play, when I originally started playing it, did say as a variant you could use a D12 and it said you would make the game easier that way because you are not cycling through the deck quite as much. The reason that I'm using the D12 and will continue to do that doesn't have to do with the ease of the game, but it has to do with the fact that as you are playing the game, you're drawing cards into your hand and making them unavailable for this random number. It changes the balance of the numbers available, and also I laid out all the cards. When I got these, I laid out all the cards and saw that Indeed, even from the beginning, there were not the same number of random numbers for all of them, and that bothered me. Now, I don't know enough about uh, probability and statistics to know how this would impact the game, but psychologically, I do know that it made me feel as if I had even less control over the random 
number that was being generated. So I'm going with the D12 and I am also going with a slightly different mode of play in terms of using the map cards and the setup. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to separate out these map cards and I will pull them into my hand when I arrive at this map. The map cards tell you a couple things. They tell you not only where you are traveling to, but they also give a benefit that you will have as long as you are in this section of the map. The map card you start out in does not have any benefit, but all the other ones do. So when you are in a section of the map, you do need to have them in your hand. So I will pull it into my hand to get this benefit. They also, as stated, give this random number, but I'm disregarding that in my playthrough. And they also give the directions that you can possibly travel to from where you are. But if you have this handy printed version of the entire world, and this is the little um, icon I'm using to represent myself, you will know physically where you can travel to in the world. One other point to make about the map cards is that Many of the locations have a number in brackets. You can see here this 8 plus in brackets, um, or here this is a dash in brackets. This is a number that's called the lay low number. If you can pull a random number or roll at that value or higher, you can opt to lay low in that area. If there's a dash, it's not an area that you can lay low in. Laying low is basically a way of resting, and it means you can do a couple of things. It means you can recover a certain number of cards that you have exhausted during the course of your travels, and the amount of cards you can recover is equal to the recovery number of your current character stat. I'm showing you here the player card that you start with. You have basically no stats, but you do start with a recovery number of two. So when laying low you, with a recovery number of two, you can pull two cards back up into your hand. The other thing you can do if you're at a, a village, a city, or a port is you could trade. And trading is representing by discarding a couple of cards to pull in a random common item. So you would discard some cards and then you would search for a random common item to bring into your hand. If you are at a city and you are able, you can discard four cards and then pull in an uncommon item. So that represents trading that can be done and you can also just do basic discard. So when at a when you are at a map location with a lay low value, if you opt and you can successfully lay low, those are options you can also do. The majority of the types of cards in the deck are called quest cards and quest cards are going to tell the story of your adventure. They are going to have a number of different things. The majority of what will be on them are various encounters and the numbers here indicated are the number that you're going to roll on your d12 or which you would pull in from the random draw to indicate which encounter you're going to be dealing with on this card. Generally speaking, the higher number, the more difficult the encounter. And you can see where there's some replayability because you could be pulling in this card and having potentially these three different types of encounters. There's going to be a letter up here in the upper right. This is going to list the terrain type of the card and it will match, for example, the city. So when you are arriving in a map location, getting back to the maps here, you'll see they all have letters here. So Stonefoot, for example, is has this letter G, which indicates that you could pull in and encounter terrain city, and it also has a C, so there's a different type of terrain. I can't remember offhand what C is, but you can see the cards here all have the letters, and C would be, okay, a rough city. So you could be pulling in, if you were in Stonefoot, either type of terrain card for your encounter. The other thing that is on here is at the bottom, this is a very clever use of all these cards, if you turn them upside down you will find listing for either a common or an uncommon item with the benefit that it gives you. So this card and all cards can be used, carried in your hand, 
turned upside down to represent items that you may be rewarded with for a successful encounter or that you may pick up along the way. So this is an example of a typical quest card and again it has they all have the random number at the bottom and if you're playing the game that way when instructed to draw a random number you would be drawing whatever card came up and using it solely for this number. For setup you are instructed to remove the player card and you place this into your hand. You are also instructed to remove the map one card and you place it into your hand and it's important to note, it's a little counterintuitive that the player card which has setup information and some starting rumors on it is actually a card in your hand but it's important because you need cards in your hand to discard in order to do some encounters. And you also take the one year has passed card and pull that out. This goes at the bottom of the draw deck. And this card is important because as you cycle through it, it instructs you to add certain modifiers to your random rolls, which basically is going to increase the difficulty as you move through the deck repeatedly of all the encounters. Because as I mentioned, the encounters with the higher numbers are generally more difficult or maybe always more difficult and you also play or pull out this um, X0 encounter card. So your starting hand becomes the map, your player card, and this first encounter card. Now again, reminder, I am playing using this map to indicate where I am so I'm going to be starting at Ulendi right here and this is per the actual rules. You can note on your player card that basically you're starting with no skills and these are skills that will come into play to solve certain types of encounters and during the course of the game you may attain items that will level these up. You do have a recovery of two and we already talked about what the recovery is. So we've done this setup here and now we need to draw one common item as our starting loot. What we do is we randomly draw cards from this deck and we look at the bottom here, we, we draw them this way to look and see until we get something marked common. So that is uncommon and we got a common here right away. We um, got this hunting wolf, I guess that's a, maybe a companion. It gives us a survival plus one modifier. So this will bring our survival skill here up to one. When we hold this card in our hand, we hold it upside down. So we're not using it for any of these encounter values, we're simply using it as the common item. And this represents now our starting hand of cards. A note on what you do with the cards that you discard. You are meant to be placing them, well actually I forgot to do something. You take this one year has passed card and you place it at the bottom of this draw deck. So as you pull up cards and ultimately you will get to it, then you have to um, reshuffle and apply the modifier as relevant. When you are drawing and discarding cards, what you are meant to be doing is placing them back under this deck. And the reason for that is that you will be instructed at certain points to search through this deck for these terrain values and the cards that are discarded are still cards that you're meant to search. Now just um, logistically I find it uh, difficult to keep picking up this deck and putting them under so I am actually physically just putting them over here as the discard but when I do need to search I pull them back in and search as you are meant to do and um, that just makes more physical sense to me to do it. So basically now we are ready to go. We've got our uh, place that we're starting. We have our welcome card here and we are in this port city and um, again to save my voice I'm going to just hold up the card here and you can read what we are meant to do and pause it to read that and we'll see what we do. Now I don't like the sound of the uh, Rat Harbor which is this option here so I'm going to take the boat to Bridgewater and here I am as a reminder the options are to go to Rat Harbor here 
or the uh, boat to Bridgewater. Now I will rem or say, because I didn't, that in each turn the order is the same. You can opt to lay low if you are in a location where you have not already had an encounter, but we're not, so that's not an option here. Then you can travel, then you can have your encounter, and then you can rest. And that is the turn order for every turn. So in this particular case, we're moving right on to the travel section, and we are allowed to travel in any of these areas that have the dots here. So we're traveling to Bridgewater, and what we need to do is, were we playing by using the random draw, we would be drawing up this card for the random number. Instead, because I'm using the D12, we will be rolling that um, once we have our correct encounter card. To find the encounter card, we note again that Bridgewater is a V, and that means it is a village. So we need to find an encounter card that matches this terrain. Again, as a reminder, if we wanted to lay low, we would need to roll a 7 plus. However, you can't just go somewhere and lay low. You can only lay low if you've already had an encounter there. So that is not an option. So the first thing we do is um, we pull, um, I think I moved this, let's see. Yeah. <clears throat> That's the, this is the one year has passed. I need to get that under there. So um, this is the previously discarded card that um, we had to cycle through to get our common item. And now we just pull cards until we find one that has the correct terrain. And we're looking for a V. And here is a V. So this indicates that we are in a village and what we need to do now is roll our D12 to see which of these encounters we are going to be facing and we roll a 10. We've arrived at this village and we're just starting out here and lo and behold, there's an archery contest going on. The village is having a friendly contest. Perhaps you'd like to try your skills. If you enter, you must wager a common item card. Make a random draw. You must now make a combat check that beats that draw. You may use any number of skill cards. If we win, we get back our original wager card plus a random common item. If we lose, we're going to lose the card we wagered. Well, why not? We're going to do it. Um, we only have the one common item card. Remember, this is our hand, and we drew... Well, that's not our hand. <laughs> that's, those are the map cards. Um, this is our hand. We have this hunting wolf. It offers us a survival skill. Now, unfortunately, um, our com we have no combat bonus. So basically what we need to do in order to be successful is we would um, make a random draw, or in my case of playing, roll a d12, and we need to uh, beat whatever um, that draw is. So, so in this case, what we're going to do and you'll see, you know, the random nature of this game. Right here, we've got nothing to benefit from. So first of all, in order to do this encounter, we need to discard or rather exhaust a card. And um, it doesn't really matter. We're not getting any skills here. So we've, we're wagering this card, so we're just going to put that down there. And we will be exhausting a card in order to have this encounter. The first thing we need to do is get the random number that we're trying to beat. We got a four. Okay, now in order to participate in this archery contest, we need to um, roll a four or greater in order to get our card back and to get another card. So let's see what we can do. We have no modifiers and we have failed. So what we do now is we have lost our hunting wolf. That was the common item that we started with. We're going to put that back in. Actually, I think this gets discarded out of the game. We are down to these two cards in our hand and we'll refer back and just confirm if you lose you endure their laughter and must discard the card you wagered. So unfortunately uh, this goes into the discard pile. We we set out, we were excited and perhaps over enthusiastic when we arrived at this village and now with our tail between our legs we have failed. 
And now what we can do is rest and what we can do is recover cards up to our recovery. Unfortunately, we're only getting one back because we lost our common item that we had wagered. Had we chosen this turn to lay low here, when we did the rest action, we would have been able to do a um, recovery action twice. So we could have potentially gotten back four cards. With our tail between our legs, we're going to travel back to the uh, where we started. And let me get reorient you here. So we're going to come back to uh, you, Lendy. We're going to move back as our travel uh, phase here. We are going to then have an encounter. So we will be drawing and looking for, well, we have the um, XO in our hand, so that's not an option. We're looking for a U or a G card here from our draw deck. So we'll pull them and see until we get the proper terrain. And here is a terrain. So we disregard this, um, what this says here, the X5 and the X um, terrain are specific, the over our overarching quest. We haven't gotten to that yet. We're still just starting out and traveling around. We have arrived at this port, and indeed it is the port of Ulendi. Peaceful travel. You hunker down in a cheap inn, swilling mead and fish stew. No encounters. You see a traveling wizard from the Wizards College. Snobs. They don't allow commoners into the school without a token from a master wizard. Well, that sounds like a clue, but uh, the main point is that we're not doing anything here. We don't have anything that needs to happen, so we discard that. Unfortunately, we have no further cards to draw in to rest, so we can move into the next turn. Now, what I'm going to do here is refer to the map card and point out, here we are. We can move, per the indication here, we can move off of this map card onto map number three. And that's what I want to do. The reason that I want to do that, we draw this into our hand, because it will give us um, another card in our hand to use that we need uh, as a discard card. And that kind of represents the rigors of travel. And as you are adventuring, you're getting a little bit stronger, even if the card doesn't offer a modifier. But in this case, it does. It offers us a skill, a plus one charm. So we are traveling here, and we're going to travel to Spraymere. And Spraymere is the U or G, which is, I can't remember, um, I guess port or city, or something like that. I'll put that up to be correct. And we need to draw in the proper terrain to have our encounter. So we continue to draw until we get to a U or a G card. And you can see sometimes you end up drawing through more cards. Here we go. Here is a G. It is a city card. And now we need to do our random roll to see what number encounter we're going to have to deal with. Ugh, 12. So the higher numbers are generally more difficult. And we rolled a 9 plus, a fertility ritual. The spirits of the city are inflamed with the fertility gods festival. Many city dwellers offer a night of wild desire. You accept. Now, we need to do a survival check, and uh, we see what the benefits or detriments are here. Do we have any... Um, I think our survival is still at zero, because... Um, yeah, we don't have any... This card is just giving us a charm one, so if it was um, some type of charm... Well, for example, had we rolled lower... Uh, the charm check, we would have had a one benefit, but we don't. We rolled for this, so we will just give it a roll and see what we get. We got a 12. 9 plus. You retain your stamina and depart your companion's abode well rested. Take a free recovery. Well, that's great, um, although we don't have anything to recover, but that was pretty good. So we have traveled around and in so doing at least obtained um, the, this different map card. And now we have the option of continuing on and going somewhere else. And we are going to opt to go to Rhyme Pass, which is a mountainous area here. And we're just going to walk along. It is still in map area three. So we're going to go here, walking this way. And we're going to be, um, again, pulling in, just sort of reoriented things here so you can see. We're going to be pulling in um, until we get a mountainous 
terrain card and have that encounter. And here we go. So let's put these over here. And again, um, per the rules, so here's my discard. I'll just show you. Here's my, here's my discard, but um, per the rules, they're actually placed under here. So we have this the one stack here of the cards, and um, we're moving through them, and coming up to the top is the one year has passed card. But for the moment, we're in the mountains, and let's roll uh, our D12 and see what, uh, what we're going to get. And we got a one. So let's uh, pull back in this mountain card. It says one to four. Fallen climbers, the remains of unlucky adventurers lay at the bottom of a deep ravine. They might have valuables. If you choose to, you may climb down and do a survival check. And uh, if we get eight or less, we fall. Okay, let's do it. Let's do a survival check. We don't have, fortunately, we don't have any benefit. Um, the card, the common item that we had to discard that we lost wagering would have given us a plus one on survival, but we don't have that. Um, in order to do this, we do need to exhaust a card. So I will exhaust a card and we're going to hope for, well, ideally we're going to hope for a nine or better. Oop. And we got a nine or better. We got a nine actually. So uh, let's see, what did we get? Climb down safely, gain a random kind common item. So what we do here in order to get the common item is we pull, and when we're looking for items, we flip them this way because that is what, um, what we have, and we see we get some provisions and supplies. So this comes into our hand, and that has been our encounter. I've just been showing you traveling around and having some encounters. We didn't get a combat encounter, but I want to talk about how that works so I can explain it. I just pulled this to show. Um, if we came to this swamp and we're having to deal with these swamp tentacles, we would have this here, combat check. One at seven plus, a round speed of two, and it tells you what the damage is. What this means is you've got one round of combat, this first number here, and it could go up to four even and you need to attain a value of seven or higher. For each round that you are going through combat, you can play up to two cards. So in this particular case, for example, if you were holding in your hand some combat benefit cards, such as the um, you had the archery and snaring skill, for example, or you had this rusty dagger, you could choose to play up to two of them to add to your roll for this round. You could do either one or two here, and then if you're successful, you get um, whatever benefit is. If you're unsuccessful, you get a damage, which means you have to exhaust a card, and it tells you here what the failure is. So um, you'll see combat. This is an easy combat I chose to show. Uh, more difficult ones, let's see. Here, this Swamp Witch, for example, well, that's also just one round. Well, let me find something that is here without showing you. Again, I'm sort of trying not to show you too much of the cards here. This particular combat check with the lizard men, it's um, going to be three successes at five or greater. You've got a round speed of three, so you could use up to three cards each time, but you have to attain five or greater. So for this, there's like more rounds of combat, although maybe they're not as strong. So that's what, that's how combat works. A couple of other thoughts about the game to remind um, us of the option of going to cities and doing trades. That is, I think, useful to do early on in the game because you want to get more common items into your hand, and certainly if you can get uncommon items into your hand, that's great too, although you have to be able to discard four cards to make that happen. Additionally, avoiding travel to the areas of the map that are a little more dangerous, which are map cards five and six, um, is also wise to do at the beginning of the game. What I have not shown you intentionally is travel to any of the um, locales that are part of the major quests because I don't really want to reveal what is there. As I said, there is definitely replayability in the game, but um, 
it is not unlimited. So I didn't want to reveal any of that because part of what this game is, is about discovery. You can see from what I have shown here that there's definitely a very random nature to the game. And one of the um, concerns about it that I have had is if you happen to be needing to scroll through a lot of cards to get to the right terrain number, what ends up happening is the year has passed card will come up sooner and sooner. And every time that card comes up, it causes you to add a value to the encounter number, making the encounters harder and harder. With a uh, poor, you know, randomization of the terrain cards at the beginning, you can be scrolling through a lot. You're not really doing anything except having bad luck of not being able to match up the terrain. That has happened to me, and right at the beginning, you just can kind of die a lot because you're forced to um, up the encounter level before you've really been able to build up your character. I misspoke a little bit. After the first year, um, you just get this flavor text. The land grows restless. The air smells dire as evil creeps in from the north. So you don't have to add on a value. But after the second year and moving forward, then you are adding a plus one to your random draw. And that does make it more difficult. To mitigate some of that luck factor, you could, and I have, started the game with one, two, or even three common items in your hand. Um, does it make the game easier? Sure, I suppose, but to me, the difficulty level, this game isn't so much difficult as it is random, and that can be a little bit frustrating when you're just not, you don't have any options in your hand, especially early on. So for me, another variant that I like to do, although I didn't demonstrate it here, is to start with a couple of common items in my hand. It gives a little more flexibility at the beginning, and the point of the game is you want to adventure, you want to build up, you want to have options and have some successes. Of course, you do get to rest each time, so you can pull back cards into your hand, but if you uh, remain too long with no skill assets, uh, no skill benefits, you're simply based on a random draw or a roll of the d12, and it can get frustrating if you're not successful. So overall, this is a game that is clearly um, has been lovingly developed, and it really does, it's charming, and it really does offer a little adventuring experience in a box. I don't myself now travel so much for work anymore, but I used to, and had this game been around when I did that, I definitely would have packed it up and brought it with me. It's that kind of game, and um, that's a brief look inside Barbarian Vince.